the panel who came out tonight. Um, I would like to introduce you all. Starting with my far left, we have Susie, Susie Loftus. She's the current general. <laughs> I think that's my mom. <laughs> She's the current general counsel of the San Francisco Sheriff's Department. She served as the president of the San Francisco Police Commission from 2012 to 2017. She served as general counsel of uh, the California Department of Justice under Kamala Harris. She was a veteran, a former prosecutor. Uh, she's a leading authority on criminal justice reform and crime prevention. And we thank her so very much. She has four beautiful, four? Three. Three, but it feels like four. Daughters <laughs> who she's left tonight to be here with us, so thank you. Um, to her right, we have our new chief of police in San Francisco, William Bill Scott. He was sworn in as San Francisco's chief of police in January of this year, so he's still trying to catch his breath, I'm sure. Um, but before that, he served 27 years in the Los Angeles Police Department, and he became their deputy chief of their South Bureau um, before being promoted to that position in 2012. So Chief, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. To my right, we have Norm Stamper. Um, he is the former police chief of Seattle uh, from 1994 to 2000. Before that, he served 28 years as a police officer in San Diego. Um, he has his PhD in leadership and human behavior, which I think what is, makes him very special to have these conversations around policing uh, with a science degree. And he is the author of two great books, which is, again, what got our friend Julie Tron started here. Breaking Rank, a top cop's expose on the dark side of American policing and to protect and serve how to fix America's police. You can got, get either of these on Amazon. <laughs> to his right, <laughs> we have Malia Cohen. Uh, Malia is the supervisor of the 10th District uh, here in San Francisco. She was first elected as, uh, to our Board of Supervisors in 2010 and re-elected again in 2014. Her area includes Bayview, Hunters Point, Potrero Hill, the Dog Patch, and Visitation Valley. So those of you not from San Francisco, you know that she is very, ve very, very invested in this topic given her district. Um, she serves as the chair of the Board of Supervisors Budget and Finance Committee, which means she wields a lot of authority and a lot of power in San Francisco on that board and the foremost supervisor in advocating for police reform, frankly. She created, um, she was behind the creation of the Department of Police Accountability, which used to be the Office of Citizens Complaints, and she oversees the implementation of the DOJ's nearly 400 recommendations that they were given la late last year. And to her right, and last and certainly not least. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have uh, Thomas Tippi Mazuko. I will call you Tippy if you don't mind. Um, he is the vice president of the San Francisco Police Commission, currently serving his third term. He is also a law partner at the Murphy, Pearson, Bradley, and Feeney firm. He served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Northern District for nine years, and he served as an assistant DA in the city and county of San Francisco for 10 years before that. Please join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. So before we move on, I would like to ask David Risk to stand. He is one of our task force members. Um, so when we pulled this panel together, you know we're a nonprofit, so we don't always have a lot of money, right? And so we said, Norm Stamper needs a place to sleep when he's here <laughs> in San Francisco. Can you help us? So I would like to thank the Kecker, Van Est, and Peters firm so for uh, sponsoring the accommodations for our chief here to my right. Thank you very much, David, for making that happen. Okay, so Mary gave a really good uh, overview of why we're here and why we're having this conversation in San Francisco. The only thing that I would add to that is that when we started this task force, there was a lot of chatter uh, that San Francisco didn't need anything like this, <coughs> that we were different from the rest of the country and that we got it. And within six or eight months of the formation of the task force was the Mario Woods incident that happened here in San Francisco. Um, so. That's why we're here having this conversation, and what we're trying to do is make it better, and I think we have a lot of opportunity to make it better now. We have a new chief of police. We have a new department of police accountability. 
we have a, a transition in the board of, uh, on the police commission. Several members have transitioned on and off and they all have you know, their great skill set. So I think it's a, it's a time of change which also always in my mind means a time of opportunity. Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions via note cards. So on each of your seats, you should have found a note card and a pen. If you have questions, there will be people collecting them from you. Uh, the questions will be vetted, and then they'll be brought up, and we'll save the last 20 minutes of the program for that. Okay. So the first question is kind of a tee-up question uh, to get us all kind of level set on the issues. But I'm going to start with you, Susie with how would you describe the current culture of policing both nationally and in San Francisco right now? Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here. Is this on? Yep. Yes. It's a good start. OK. <laughs> um, so I think you have to start nationally. Um, and I think you have to look at what's coming out of Washington, because it has an effect on all of us. And it has an effect on what's happening for police officers across this country. When you have the Attorney General of the United States suggesting that the top two priorities for local police officers are to one, become immigration officers, and two, suggesting to prosecutors that they should be seeking mandatory sentences regardless of the crime, we've got a real problem in this country. So I think those of us in San Francisco who are focused on these issues and have for some time been focused on criminal justice reform have to uh, be very focused on what's coming out of Washington and how it affects what happens here. Because just like Ferguson, Missouri had a ripple effect, when those statements are coming out of Washington and it's suggesting that all police departments and all police officers view their role in the same way, in a place like San Francisco, that's going to make it much more difficult for the officers on the street. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult for the work that the department is doing to build trust. All of the work that we've done to say police officers ultimately need community and community needs police. In San Francisco, which is a sanctuary city, what we've tried to do for decades is suggest it's more important that you feel safe to call the police. We don't care of what, of what the immigration, your immigration status is. We want you to call. <coughs> And what we know about a crime like domestic violence, which is one of the most lethal crimes, is it'll take seven times for a woman or a man to be abused before they call the police. So injecting hesitancy into whether or not you feel like your police department, you can differentiate whether they agree with Jeff Sessions or whether they agree with Bill Scott, is very dangerous for local police departments. And so first, I think the national conversation does affect what's happening here. <clears throat> That being said, as we've always said, San Francisco can be a beacon of hope and demonstrate what it means to have conversations like this, bring diverse voices together, and reject this idea that you're either on the side of the police or you're on the side of the community, but rather say, what does it take to create a safe city? And we're going to find a way to do that together, uh, separate from the toxic rhetoric that's coming out of Washington. OK, Chief. <clears throat> This one's on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the current the current culture is is you have a culmination of things going on. We have a, a basically the era that we're in now with technology uh, being what it is, where incidents are being captured routinely that in the past um, people never got to see, and that does two things. Number one, I think it really it really for a lot of people it validates. Um, a lot of things that have happened in the history of law enforcement that people would complain about and maybe not be heard, maybe be marginalized, and now people are, are able to say, look, you know, we've seen these incidents on television, uh, people are capturing them on cell phone videos or, or even our own technology, and there are a significant number of folks out there of all colors, uh, walks of life, that are saying, see, we told you this was going on all, all, all along. And I think that's caused a couple of things. Um, although we know that, by and large, the vast majority of officers that take on this, this work are doing their jobs like they're supposed to. But there, there are some that don't. And it becomes a, an issue, I think, for us in the law enforcement world to really, number one, do two things. Acknowledge and have some, some acknowledgment that things have 
historically um, not always been as they should be. And I think that's really important for, for us as a profession and for the public to really hear that because now that we see these things more and more on television and on the, the, the evening news, it does validate a lot of what a lot of people are saying. So in the past, I think it's been very difficult for our profession to acknowledge that, that there have been some issues in law enforcement historically in this country. And so getting to the culture of, of law enforcement right now, I think there are many of us in this profession that uh, are willing to acknowledge that, many of us in leadership positions that are willing to acknowledge that. I think there are many people that have you know, retired that were willing to acknowledge that. But with that, I think there's also uh, the temptation to feel like the profession is under attack because right now we have uh, so much scrutiny on the profession, and rightfully so. So the, having a culture or, or, or preventing a culture that becomes us versus them, I think is critical right now in this profession and for our country. Um, as, as Ms. Loftus has said, you know, there's, there's so much going on right now that really will make it really easy for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But depending on how we lead, those of us in leadership positions, how we lead this, this dynamic that we're in right now makes a tremendous difference as to how we move forward. Once we do acknowledge, then the question becomes, what are we gonna do to change the game? Or are we doing enough to change the game? And I think, particularly here in this city, uh, we're definitely trying. And I think we're not different from other departments. I mean, this, we have done a lot in the city to, to change that dynamic. And I think, uh, by and large, in most urban cities, you're seeing that happen. Now, I, I, getting, getting to the conversation that Ms. Loth has just brought up, you know, I've seen you know, publications across the country where uh, people are, are kind of reversing on some of their stances on sanctuary cities and whatnot, and I think that's confusing for a lot of people in the public. Um, but we have to resist temptation to, be, to get defensive about how we need to move forward. And our culture, I think, really in the leadership of, of how we approach that really is gonna make a difference as to whether we, we do that successfully or not moving forward, and it's really, really important. I think we're at a critical juncture right now in law enforcement. And I think you have a lot of people that are come to this profession for the right reasons, wanting to do the right thing, uh, willing to accept that things, some things need to change. I also think that you know, some people are resistant to change, and how we lead them really matters. Thank you very much, Chief. Norm, what would you say the culture is nationally in policing? The culture is paramilitary, it is top-down, it is um, alienated in many respects from the very communities that our police officers are hired to protect and serve. That's not a statement uh, or even a condemnation of the quality of the individuals who seek out a police job. It is, however, a, a, an answer to the question that I raise in, in the, as a subtitle to my most recent book, which is how to fix America's police. Uh, that question alone causes police officers to say, well, that sounds like you're saying it's broken, and I am. I am saying that the system, the institution of American policing got off on the wrong foot back in the 1800s. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, it became apparent to those in Great Britain uh, that it was necessary in order to deal with the enormous lawlessness associated with the Industrial Revolution to organize a police force. Nobody really wanted to do that. Sir Robert Peel, the Home Secretary, and I'll make my history lesson very, very short, uh, had to work for seven to, to nine years to convince a very reluctant parliament to go along with the idea of organized police. What's wrong with neighbors watching out for neighbors? Turn the lights on at night, the gas lamps, turn them off in the morning, uh, you know, raise the hue and cry if somebody's being the victim of a crime or a barn is burning. In other words, look out for our one another's public safety. But the results of, of the industrial, the social results of the industrial revolution produced an enormous amount of lawlessness, highway robberies, arson, bank robberies, so on and so forth. 
So uh, he ultimately presided over the work that took place resulting in 1829 with the Metropolitan Police Act. American cities were experiencing the same problems. So they're sending emissaries or ambassadors over to, to Great Britain to examine uh, the Metropolitan Police Act, which was very carefully uh, constructed and which had built in safeguards to help reduce the opportunities for the fears, uh, you know, the legitimate fears of a population that the police would become militaristic, that they would become agents of tyranny. And that, it's on those grounds that they basically fought the Metropolitan Police Act. But when ultimately it was passed and the Americans send their folks over to look at the system, they come back with a very sketchy outline of how you organize a, a, a police force in Boston, in Philly, uh, in Chicago, and certainly in New York City. And by the way, in San Francisco and Seattle, two cities that for all the world present as East Coast cities in some respects to my eye. And there was, uh, I, there are good historical reasons for that, that are beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But I will say this, they left out those safeguards. And so from the very beginning, the very first baby steps of American policing, we did not benefit from the considerable work and research and study that went in to the Metropolitan Police Act. So fast forward to today, many of those same issues are yet unresolved. I was interviewing a young African-American man who uh, lives in my neighborhood, which is Orcas Island and the San Juan Islands off the state of Washington. He was a chef there, uh, and one of maybe three or four African Americans on the whole island. But he came out of the kitchen and said, uh, you know, I'd really love to talk to you about this book that you're writing. And I was in search of someone to talk to about the talk that African-American parents, it's cliche now, but it's really an important uh, area for us to explore. Why would an African-American mom or dad or both sit down with their young children and have the talk about how they're to behave in the presence of police? And of course, the short answer is survival. If they, get, if they have a contact with the police, those parents want those children to come home. He told me over coffee about two, three weeks later uh, that his father, he was raised as a, as a, uh, in a single parent family, his father, uh, who was an engineer, uh, had the talk with him when he was four years old. And he says it wasn't just one talk, it was a continuing lecture series that went on pretty much all of his childhood into his adolescence and over and over and over, his father would drive home the things you do do and the things you don't do in the presence of a police officer. At the end of about two hours of interviews, uh, of the interview, uh, I asked him, well, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, uh, Laquan McDonald, Walter Scott, the, the long list of police officers who have unjustifiably shot and killed young African-American men is truly a depressing uh, tableau to, to think about the numbers of, of innocent people shot and killed by the police whose shootings could and should have been prevented, in my judgment. We can talk about controversial shootings, or we can talk about the incontroversial, uh, incontrovertible evidence that in two of those, the Laquan McDonald incident in Chicago, the Walter Scott incident in North Charleston, South Carolina, were cold-blooded murders committed by police officers in uniform. That is seen now, where in the past I asked Darul, my friend, why all the attention now? And he picked up my iPhone, which I was using as a recording device, tapped its screen and said, you see, we have always known in our community that this has been going on. This is no surprise to us whatsoever when a police spokesperson stands before a bank of microphones, perhaps the chief or the sheriff, 
in this city or that city and says it's a tragic death. We're all saddened by it. Our hearts go out to fill in the blanks. He said, we're now seeing what we have known to be the truth for a long, long time. And white middle class America is also seeing it, which is why there's much greater support for changing the structure of policing, which is needed in order to change the culture of policing, which gives rise to these incidents and really poses for us the, the challenge that I think we all face. Thank you so much, Norm. Thank you. Malia. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I, uh, my background is not in law enforcement. I have a master's degree in public policy and management. I'm an elected official. I'm a native San Franciscan. And so the lens that, I, that I've come to the table and my own set of experience is very different from um, those that have served and continue to serve uh, in law enforcement. My perspective really, I think, is more rooted in the community. Um, and as a person who maybe, possibly like many of you, s have sat in the seat at home or on the couch, uh, reading, your, reading the news, watching the news, if seen the countless numbers of shootings and um, have been f placed in a helpless, vulnerable pl position and wondering, what can I do? What can I do? Well, as a legislature, as a policymaker, I've got the ability to do something. And the question is, is how do you describe the current culture of policing nationally? Nationally, I would describe it as a warrior mentality us against them. I must come into this community and protect that is what's valuable, property, white middle class status and value. And, and how do we, um, so that's what I'm seeing nationally. Now what I'm seeing locally is a, a, is a shift from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. So I believe the city of Oakland has done successfully a, a, um, a shift in their thinking in the police culture, and it was a very difficult culture shift. And I'm seeing the same culture shift beginning to take place in the city and county of San Francisco with the San Francisco Police Department, with hard conversations about where we are and where we need to go. There was a shooting Excuse me. This was um, back when Greg Sir was the chief of police, and I recall I've been on the board. This is my seventh year, seven year, seven out of out of, out of an eight year term, and I've been dealing with shootings since day one. Um, when it comes to um, the violence, either officer involved shootings or vi violent crimes, and I remember when we were watching Ferguson erupt. And I remember having a conversation with Greg, and he said, thank God we're not Ferguson. And my first initial thought was, yeah, thank God. Man, they got it hard out there in Ferguson, Missouri. Whew. It's a good thing things are pretty good here in San Francisco. But when you begin to pull back the layers, we have, and we are addressing them now, some true deep-seated issues and concerns. And I have to tell you, it's only recently that we have begun to capture data around our problems. If we're not capturing who's being stopped, at what, fre at what frequency, how often, who's doing the stopping, where are the stoppings, in the, in stoppings happening, and I'm saying stopping, I mean officers pulling people over, how are we able to even quantify that we even have a problem? All we are left with are anecdotal stories. And up until the 21st century technology, remember, these were just stories that you heard that were passed down from generation to generation. Your father told it to you, your uncle, your cousins, shared stories around the barber shop or the nail shop, your lady. The point that I'm making is, is that there is a cultural change that is happening, certainly in San Francisco, and I would say in the Bay Area, Oakland specifically, is that we are shifting from a warrior mentality, police coming in, guns blazing, barking orders, drop it, drop it, drop it, to time and distance, de-escalation, talking to people, and coming in and assessing a situation before you pull out your rifle, your 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 gun, your your um, your gun, your weapon, and you discharge it. 
And I think that that's a, mo a very critical shift that I'm seeing that's here happening in San Francisco. Now, I am concerned, because I don't think it's happening nationally, particularly with Jeff Sessions in place. Now, I don't want to offend any Republicans. I know statistically there's got to be one or two in this room. No. There's one <laughs> or two in this room. <laughs> well, I won't call you out. But I am concerned with the practice of mandatory minimums. With the, I'm concerned with the conversation that's happening about if you are with Black Lives Matter or you're standing with the community, that automatically means you're against law enforcement. That is ridiculous. You can be supportive of law enforcement and be supportive of the community. And I gotta be, fit, be honest, it's been hard even trying to get the community to wrap their minds around what, that, that notion. It's, 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 a, it's a precarious situation, I think, that we're in, but we've got to continue to push and have thoughtful, difficult conversations so that we can get and move beyond this place of us versus them, warrior versus guardian mentality. Thank you. Thank you, Malia. So, Tippy, I'm going to add one spin to your piece of that question. So, Malia mentioned how uh, Oakland has transitioned. We all know that they did it under a mandate. Uh, they did not have a, a choice. San Francisco right now has a choice. Do you think we can get there? Um, so talk about the culture and whether or not you think San Francisco can, can get there on its own. Well, it directs me right to the culture of San Francisco. You know, candidly, San Francisco has been ahead of the curve for a while. We're not perfect. There's been issues, mm -hmm. and everybody recognizes those issues. But San Francisco has a willingness to have a dialogue. In a dialogue between the officers and the community, we have people on the Board of Supervisors who are concerned, who can sit down with the police department and the community and bring people together. So can we make the change? Yes. And are, have we been making the change? Absolutely. If you just look from the time I'm in my ninth year in the commission, it's my third term. When I first got on the commission, there was no such thing as crisis intervention training. Yeah. There was no discussion about time and distance. Because as commissioners, by the way, I have to give a little caveat. I cannot speak about any pending cases or anything before the commission. We sit in a quasi-judicial capacity and review all officer-involved shootings, all discipline for the officers. So I will not be able to address that. But I will be able to tell you, as will my fellow former commissioner, Susie Loftus, who I miss dearly, there's two things this commission doesn't stand for. You lie, you're fired. You're racist, you're fired. Two simple fundamental rules that this commission has been following for quite a while. And that's part of setting the tone. But getting back to what we've done, we have crisis intervention training. We have de-escalation de techniques. We have body cameras. Ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna see a lot more of what takes place out on the street. And because of body cameras, for example, we saw that our use of force incidents have been reduced by 18.5% compared to last year. And I think the body cameras has an effect on both sides of the video. What else have we done? Well, we've talked about recruiting officers. This police department has been through a huge recruiting cycle. We've lost a lot of the post-Vietnam War era police officers that have entered. Mm. We have, this is an amazing thing, there's no better time for dialogue and change. We literally have, I think, Chief, 60% of the police department has less than five years in the business. These officers were in preschool when Norm Stamper retired from the police department. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but what that means is we have a new generation. And, and I think you know, Deputy Chief Chaplin will tell you, we have a new generation, and it's a different type of officer. I mean, almost every academy class has here with the Bar Association, there's lawyers in the class. Yeah. We've had Stanford lawyers, Bolt Hall lawyers, USF lawyers, Hastings lawyers. They're becoming police officers because these millennials have a different viewpoint on money and they want to serve the community. That doesn't make them great cops, but we're getting some really interesting people in the police department. So Tip, I don't think you can say these millennials. I think that's like a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the parent of, the, of two millennials, so I'm learning about this. But we basically, the police department's been changing. You just look at the things we've done. We've had these conversations. When I first got on, there was a disciplinary backlog of, I think, 89 cases of where police officers were lingering with discipline pending. And with Chief Gascon and Chief Sir, we've gone through that backlog. I think we have seven or eight cases pending right now. That's a very important factor. We have young officers that want to change. We have a command staff 
dedicated to change. We have a commission that's worked on change, and it's a big deal to us. We don't like being categorized with the rest of the country because mm -hmm. Commissioner Loftus is absolutely right. There's issues coming out of Washington, D.C. Yes, I'm one of the Republicans in the room. She <laughs> called me out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize I was sitting I, next I, to him. <laughs> I, I haven't voted Republican in 12 years. But the reality is when you're calling for maximum sentences, and you're call, our, our officers, one thing perfectly, we are a sanctuary city, and I benefited from that as a prosecutor, and we want to make people feel safe That's and right. comfortable here. That's right. That's one rule that will never change. With so, reference to being... Uh, you know, what's coming out of Washington, D.C., we've always worked well with our federal partners, but that's something we're discussing with the chief right now in light of these changes. So the state of police in San Francisco is a state of change, and I will say this. I feel strongly that we're starting at a different point than a lot of other police departments. Things aren't perfect. Things are never going to be perfect in an organization of 2,400 sworn officers. There's going to be 10 idiots that will send a stupid text message, and we'll terminate them. But overall, the San Francisco Police Department is, a, is ahead of the curve, and we're going to stay ahead of the curve, and we're going to be a national model. So I'm going to spin off your last statement, Tippy, and go to Susie. So this all sounds great. A lot has been done. New people have come on board. But just two years ago was the texting scandal. Um, I know those officers were dealt with, but I'm a little... Um, my, my jury's out on whether or not the, 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 the officers themselves have shifted and transitioned. Um, we still have Blue Lives Matter versus Black Lives Matter coming out of the, poli the POA. Um, racism exists, would you agree? Yes. Okay, so how much hope should we have because of the efforts that Tippy just took us through? The, the folks who are on the street there's still some issues. And what are you aware of that's being done about that? Okay, well, so having served on the commission, I can say this. I'm not, I'm not in, the, in the role that Tippy is currently, but I can say that I have had the unfortunate personal experience of, um, you know, you read some of the things that are in the newspaper, but we get all of the information. And I, without saying, um, some of the words that were used, I can say that when reading some of those messages, I had to remind myself to breathe. Like I, had st I stopped Thank breathing you. because they were so horrible. And so what you want to say as a human being is how is it possible that another human being would say this? It was absolutely the low point for me of my service on the commission. Because if we're not all holding ourselves accountable as a community, to say how can this be possible in our city, then then we're then we're we've got a problem. And I think the issue with bias that keeps coming up is it's so much more comfortable to be pointing at someone else and talking about your bias and your racism and what you're doing wrong. And I feel like the uh, the the perspective you have on the commission is you don't get to take any easy answers. You don't get to blame someone else. You have to take a long look at yourself and at this city and say, we need to get curious about how this could be possible. How, how is it that this is possible? And um, those are a series of tough conversations. And explicit bias and those who will, will have animus and hatred in their heart for other races and other human beings are one category. And in fact, I think we had a sergeant in the police department who helped us find a bunch of them because he shared text messages with them. So in a way, I can even find gratitude. Thank you for finding a lot of folks who have explicit bias. But the bigger issue that we're all dealing with are these vast racial disparities in who's arrested, who's detained, who's prosecuted, who's held in custody. And the dis racial disparities only go up as you matriculate through the criminal justice system. So the bias is, is, is at its lowest at the police level. And then who gets kept in custody is a larger group. Who gets prosecuted is a larger group. And I remember as a courtroom prosecutor here in San Francisco, I had a young woman who had killed someone, and she was a white woman, and she was out of custody at arraignment. And so as a prosecutor, I was asking for her to be remanded into custody when a judge in San Francisco said to me, now, Ms. Loftus, she doesn't look like someone who belongs in prison, does she? And I said, 
Well, Your Honor, you're going to have to paint the picture for me of what someone who belongs in prison looks like, because I thought it was someone who broke the law. So that, you know, again, made me very popular with the bench. Any judges here? <laughs> But so this is it, right? It's like, you know, let he who's free from sin cast a first stone. We have a bias problem. We have a racism problem in this country. Our institutions are poisoned by it. People call the cops disproportionately on people of color. You know, how many times are they saying a redhead, freckle-faced lady is casing cars? You know, so if you want to decide that only the police are racist, then you're just not looking at the whole picture. We all have to do it. And I think that's where you get pushback from police officers from what I've seen is they're just going, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, you, it can be mistaken as we don't have a problem, but there's an aspect of it that's like, in order for us to engage in this problem, we want to see other folks coming to the table in an honest way. And I, I believe that the department has made great strides, but there's a long way to go. And, you know, Chief Scott, uh, Assistant Chief Chaplin is here. They're going to need all of our support because there's a long way and many conversations that we have to go uh, to get there. Okay, so Chief, you came post-texting. Mm -hmm. How are things feeling for you right now in terms of racism within your department? Oh, there, there is, uh, to Ms. Loftus's point, it, it, it's, it's a substantial issue in terms of the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And not to take the spotlight off of <laughs> the police department or the SFPD because we have issues that, that as we have seen, uh, from the discussion that we're having right now that we have to deal with. We need to understand what the data means. And there's a lot of work that we need to do in order, number one, to extrapolate the data uh, in a meaningful way. And then secondly, what do we do with it once we have it? Because all the things that, that we're talking about, as I think Ms. Uh, Supervisor Cohen said, having the ability to really look at the data and, and let it basically be the guide to where we need to go with this issue is probably one of the most important things that we can do right now. Because this, this issue is not new, it's not immune to San Francisco. This is a historical issue across this country. Um, I've been a police officer for 27 going on 28 years. I've been an African-American male for 52 years. <laughs> and so I understand both sides of this issue. The talk that uh, Mr. Stamper was talking about, I've had it. I've had it with my kids, and I've had it given to me. So I understand these issues. But where do we move forward, and how do we get past it? Because there's a lot of smart people in this country throughout its history, and we have not been able to tackle this issue. Now we have the ability at least to take a look at the data, and we have people out there that can help us understand it. We have nationally recognized experts right here in the Bay Area yeah. that can help us understand this issue so we can move forward, and we need to take advantage of that, because mm -hmm. for, for me or anybody else, sit at this panel and say we have the answers. If I had the answers, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Right. I'd probably be doing bigger and better things. Not that this is a great job, it is, <laughs> but it's such a large issue that I'd be in demand, I think, where I wouldn't be able to be sitting here. The answers are in the future in terms of what we do with the data, how we get that data. And I, I do, one of the reasons that I came here is I do think this city has the values and the commitment to take this work forward. And I'd be disingenuous to tell you I have all the answers because I don't, but what I do see is promise. I see promise of a willingness to work, a commitment from the commission, a commitment from the mayor's office, a commitment from me and people like Chief Chaplin out in the audience mm -hmm. and from the officers. Because we do have a lot of officers that understand that we need to understand what this means. Why the disproportionality, why the disparity, and then how do we move past it and get better? Okay. So we're going to move a little bit into the reform piece of the discussion. So, Norm, in your book you say that it's possible for a police force to be tough on crime and still treat people with dignity and respect, but not with the same politics, the same paramilitary infrastructure, and the same inbred copy culture that got us here. What did you mean by this, and what does that mean for us in 2017? I start from the very basic premise that how an institution is organized 
uh, is, is the strongest uh, predictor of what its culture is going to look like. And if we're unhappy with an event that took place last night or last Tuesday, uh, and we fixate on the event only, as we must if we're investigating alleged misconduct or excessive force, and that's all we do. We hold individuals accountable, but we don't look at the system that's producing the behavior, that culture. I, I, I would just say this. Um, a long, long time ago, <laughs> when I was a police captain in San Diego, we had three cops, uh, one Latino uh, and two white police officers who resigned just coincidentally at the same time out of the same academy class. We conducted exit interviews with each of them. Uh, and the exit interviews, in the exit interviews, each of them alleged patterns, systemic patterns of racism uh, and excessive force and a slower, more apathetic response to crime in the black community. All three of them were working in Southeast San Diego, which was a predominantly African-American community at that time. And instead of round filing those reports, uh, the chief at that time decided, let's inquire, let's see if we can get a handle on the scope and nature uh, of the problem that was being ad uh, 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 simply addressed by these three officers saying, yeah, you've got that problem in Southeast San Diego. So here's what we did. I made up a list of questions. We bounced them off uh, uh, other captains. At the time, captains were rotating around the clock in San Diego. Uh, we didn't have precincts or districts. We had the whole city. So for those officers working in Southeast San Diego, I interviewed them. I was on graveyard at the time, and I interviewed 31 cops who worked that part of the city during those hours. Of the 31, 30 said yes to the question, do you personally use racial or ethnic slurs? 30 of the 31. We can chalk this up and say it's ancient history because that was, in fact, in the mid-70s. Or we can ask ourselves if there is something about the character of racism in this country, the character of homophobia and misogyny and sexism and transphobia. We can ask ourselves whether there's something about these and other brands of bigotry that exist among us as human beings. And then we really need to get to the bottom of are these people wearing our uniform? Are they, in fact, making judgments on the streets with that kind of an attitude? And we explored, we asked every one of the officers 31 questions. One of my sergeants said, I don't use it. I find it repugnant. It took my breath away, was paraphrasing what he said. And I, I listened <laughs> to the words because I asked for examples. I will not repeat them here tonight. They are unspeakably um, horrific, bigoted in, in, the, in the worst possible way. So if we had to fire every one of our cops who was basically holding that opinion, we'd, we'd be without a, you know, a police force. So I, I would just, and I'd get kind of emotional about this because on one level, I just don't get it. How is it, who raised you is one question I have. And where in the hell are your fellow officers when you're engaged, as they copped out to, in systemic excessive force, whether it was ratcheting down on the handcuffs unnecessarily, not protecting the head as you're putting somebody in the back of a cage car, or physically beating other people? Why was it that some 15, 20 years later, Rodney King is beaten and kicked and clubbed and nobody of the 20 or so bystanders watching this thing didn't wade in and stop the brutality, stop the criminal assault on Rodney King. Why didn't somebody wade in and hook him up and put them in the back seat of a cage car and drive those fellow officers to jail? The answer, short answer is, it's not part of the culture. The opposite represents, at its worst, that culture in a moment I'm going to say what I hope you will take as, as glowing praise of the police officers who deserve better, 
who deserve not to be working with people like that. And whether it's 10 cops out of 100, could please imagine if it's only 10 out of 100, the effects that those 10 have as they make their dozens of contacts every single night or day. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, get, I do get wound up. But <laughs> let me get to the discipline part of this. What we had, we understood, was a deep-seated systemic problem that went back decades. We had white police officers saying, well, my father never owned slaves, so please spare me. And his father never owned slaves, and his granddad never owned slaves, and they just get extremely defensive about, about this issue, which I understand, but cannot possibly condone. So what we decided was that the chief was going to issue some non-negotiable standards of performance and conduct, and the statement that accompanied them was, if you can't or won't live by these standards, Safeway is hiring. We want you out of here. We will not tolerate you as a San Diego police officer wearing our badge, that uniform, and, and packing that lethal weapon on, on your side. We simply will not tolerate it. We also later made a choice that I, I think is controversial in any jurisdiction. You shoot at a moving car, you're fired. That's the policy. The moment it was put out, there was a big buzz within the organization. They don't care. They don't care about our safety. They don't care about our welfare. They don't care about us and the tough, tough job we have to do. We care about that deeply. We care about police officers and the incredibly demanding, sensitive, delicate job that they do. So much do we care about it that we want to set and enforce standards that will help make them not only competent, but proud to be a police officer in this jurisdiction. So for me, it started with non-negotiable standards enforced ri rigorously. And then working with, as, as the chief points out, working with the data to address case by case the specific issues that, that came up. And we developed a whole bunch of recommendations, the vast majority of which were implemented to address the, those issues. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. That was great. Um, so I'm going to flip the script just a little bit on the discussion. So there's a belief and an understanding by some that any changes or reforms to policing, especially if they are changes to use of force practices, would put officers' lives at risk. I'm going to start with you, Tippy, because I know that the police commission just passed a use of force policy. What is your feeling on that? Do you believe that there's truth to that, that reform equals officer safety being jeopardized? I think a lot of what's happening is what Supervisor Cohn had said and Norm have said, we're changing the mentality of officers from warriors to guardians. Now, we as a commission do policy and procedure. We don't do operations. But our department general order, which I have to give all the credit to, to Susie Loftus for getting passed through the commission unanimously, it's a delicate balance in that the officers are saying, and you have to take this into consideration, here's our safety concerns. You know, and it's easy for us. Let me give you their side of it. It's easy for us to sit here as lawyers and say, well, we think they should do this. They shouldn't do that. We ask them to make split-second legal decisions and life you know, life-threatening situations. And you see how people react differently. We train them to react differently. We train them to have muscle memory. We train them through scenarios. The flip side is, well, this is what the community thinks, and this is what we've been doing. So we're trying to bring both those parties together. But there's some certain areas that there could be consensus, and that is time and distance, de-escalation techniques. I have to tell you, when I first got on the commission, if you mentioned that, some of the older officers go, oh, come on, what are you doing? Now, these younger officers, I see them on the street using it. Mm -hmm. It works. I've used it. It works. With reference to shooting at moving vehicles, you know, I'll be candid with you. I've had two police chiefs tell me, and it's true, there's no, nothing good about shooting at a car and leaving a two-ton piece of metal flying down the street. It's a public safety concern. Unless somebody's shooting at that car from you, there is limited circumstances where we have given you know, an out, you know, to talk about Nice, France. But let me tell you, 
as an assistant district attorney, I responded to officer-involved shootings. And I swore that one of the things I had accomplished is there would never be shooting at a car again. We teach our officers not to put themselves in a position where they have to shoot at a car. Sometimes it's, it's inescapable, but we've trained them not to do that. But I was there at a shooting, when my second officer-involved shooting, and I will tell you, I can remember that little girl in the back seat of the car, wedged up against the back, who was still bleeding, with blood, blood all over her Catholic school ring, because the officer shot at a fleeing car. And she was in there with two parolees. I won't drive in the Lakeshore Shopping Center anymore. So that's one of the things that we need to get across. I know Tony Tamborello worked on that case. I saw it, he saw the pictures, and that's something that's always sat with me. There's nothing to gain from shooting at a moving car unless the officer's at risk. So we've been very open, because one of our greatest concerns is the officers and their families. They want to go home at night. I'm the son of a police officer. I know what it's like to have a father who's a police officer. I know what it's like after they've had an officer-involved shooting. Hmm. Things have changed along the way. I know the pressures on their family when community looks at them and says nasty things, or the community thinks that they're a superhero. There's both sides to that. But what we've done with the use of force is that we've balanced both those concerns and issues with dialogue, with dialogue. People talk to each other, no screaming, no hollering, experts involved, and we've gone through this. And at the end of the day, I think we've reached a pretty darn good policy, thanks to Commissioner Loftus. And I should turn it over to her. She's solely responsible for fighting this fight, and she did a great job. Wow. Okay. We'll pivot to you, Ms. Solely Loftus. Responsible. Solely responsible. <laughs> No, I think it's an important question, though. And if, so for this type, if I had one thing that I wish we could have done differently, it's this. In all of the, we were all, we all lived through the time, right? The last year and a half. Everybody who chose to spend their Monday night here, you're, you're involved in this issue in some way. Many of you have been at meetings, have sat with us. In the conversation, we did not reach the line officer and say, here's why this is good for you. And here's why this is good for your family. And it's National Police Week. Mm -hmm. And it's about families that devote themselves to a noble profession, who have their loved one leave their house every day, not in jobs like many of us have, where they put their life on the line for their community. And in respect of that, the vantage point that I always had in this was a preventable officer-involved shooting. If we are able to prevent it, it benefits the police officer because in all of my time on the commission, I have never seen an officer who on that day, they went out to kill someone, or even in that shooting, that they weren't the first one hoping that that person survived. We, people can say whatever they want, but my experience is such that nobody wished it went different more than the officer. That officer has to go home, their family suffers, there are pending investigations. There are promotional exams that they get passed over. There is oftentimes civil litigation. And, and if it's preventable, if we could have a different policy, if we could give them other tools, if we could train them another way that keeps them safe so they too go home to their family and the perpetrator, whoever the person was, also goes to jail or wherever they need to go. That's where we're trying to get to. And unfortunately, it, safety is a visceral feeling. And when you trigger, uh, even so much progress that we've made, leaving officers feeling like we've made them less safe is not something that we should be happy about. It's certainly not something that I'm happy about. I think the longer that we have the policy and the more training that we invest in, uh, the better we'll be. But I do think that it's important at all times to be aware uh, that the people who do this job are an important stakeholder and need to believe in what we're doing. And I think a lot of that work is going to fall on uh, Assistant Chief Chaplin and Chief Scott because that type of change is going to have to come from them. So Chief Scott, do you think that reform, real meaningful reform, equals less officer safety? No. Why? Um, a couple of reasons. Number one, I lived through this in my former department. And uh, as a police officer, as a, as a police officer on the street, as a sergeant, as a lieutenant, while uh, the Los Angeles Police Department went through 13 years of reform, and I can say for me personally, um, I never felt that my threat, my safety was threatened. I can say as a leader, as a sergeant, as a lieutenant, when I got in front of a, a, a room full of officers and spoke on policy, pretty much the sentiment, and there's always discussion. Don't get me wrong, there's always discussion. But at the end of the day, once the policy has been discussed and is put in place and 
the policy is the policy, you, you move past it. And that my mentality is this, particularly here, because all this was happening as I as I got sworn in, or you know, right right around that time when the policy actually changed a month before I got here. So I was following this via the you know the media and via the the uh, the internet and everything that was going on the police commission's website and seeing the different drafts of the policy. This policy was very well thought out, and there are folks that have differing opinions. But I think by and large, once the policy was put in place and after it was challenged and, and that was done, um, the policy is there. And we will move on and we will do our jobs. And it's a good policy in my opinion. Um, it doesn't threaten anybody's safety. There are some changes that are significant, but um, I can tell you this from my experience in the Los Angeles Police Department when things change in the policy, number one, you make sure you understand the policy. Number two, it helps if you understand the whys, and that's our job as leaders to understand the whys. I mean, there's a lot of research that went into the San Francisco Police Department's policy change, and it's incumbent upon me and, and people like me and Chief Chaplin and others in leadership positions to understand or to explain to officers why we are doing what we're doing. And the vast majority of officers that I have talked to on the field, and I've been uh, beating, the, beating the streets, if you will, talking to officers, they're, they're ready to move on. They're good, I and mean, they have moved on. So I don't think it threatens our safety at all. Um, I think the changes were, were necessary, appropriate, well thought out. Uh, every side was listened to. The community had input on this, and I think at the end of the day, we, we will be just fine. Okay. Um, for those of you who have questions, you might want to write them down and we'll have folks collect them on the periphery um, just so we can get them vetted before we get to that point in the program. So Malia, in 2016, the US uh, de uh, DOJ did a study of San Francisco's police department. They issued a report that contained over 200 recommended changes within the department. Under the current federal government um, administration, it is believed that the DOJ will roll back those reforms or not do anything to make sure that they get carried out in San Francisco. From your perspective, where does that leave San Francisco to make those recommended changes? Do we have to make those recommended changes? And how will we ensure that that happens? Um, so the DOJ, can make whatever changes it wants to make. I think, well, I know the city and county of San Francisco is committed to implementing each and every one of the changes. And it's not just the changes. The DOJ issued 272 recommended changes. Uh, there was a blue ribbon panel, and then there was the civil grand jury that ultimately made a recommendation of over 470 uh, recommendations. That's a significant amount of recommendations to make to, to one law enforcement agency. But I gotta tell you, the the sentiment on the Board of Supervisors is we are going to be working to implement each and every one of them. My understanding uh, through my conversations with Chief Scott is that we are going to be working to implement them. And also we have the assurances from, the, um, from Mayor Lee that we are going to be implementing these changes. So Jeff Sessions and boys over uh, at the DOJ can do what they want to do, but here in the city and county we are moving forward. It's like we have a, uh, a strategy uh, and that we are going to be, that, are, that we're sticking to. So um, that, is, that is our agenda, and that is where we're moving forward. It's in, transparent um, um, on what these priorities are. On once a quarter, the Board of Supervisors and the Police Commission meet together as a joint body. Um, excuse me. What, excuse me. Once a quarter, the police department comes to the Board of Supervisors where we sit as a committee as a whole, where they report back to us the implementation of the, uh, of the recommended, um, uh, of, of, of the recommendations, particularly those are, that are coming from the DOJ. We have such meeting happening tomorrow night. It's a long meeting, it's thoughtful, members of the public are able to participate and to weigh in, uh, but I think it is a, the necessary steps that we must continue to take to continue to bring about change and make sure that we're changing in a very transparent and open uh, process. Okay, so Tippy, from the commission's perspective, how are, are you guys interested in these changes being made at all? And oh. what are you doing to make sure that happens? Our main, our mandate from the Board of Supervisors, the Mayor's Office, but we didn't need that from the Commission, 
is to make these changes that COPS recommended. You know, for example, here's my binder of the changes that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, my community policing group met last week. We're meeting again next week. And we're, uh, we have a commander in charge. We have subgroups. And this is not just a meeting where we talk. This is a meeting, for example, let me give you the group we have. We have David Carlos Salvieri, who was one of the San Francisco Police Accountability people who would come to the commission and scream at us every Wednesday night. He's on my group. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have most incredible doctor from San Francisco General Hospital, yep. the lead trauma surgeon, Dr. Mm -hmm. Andre Campbell, mm -hmm. who had actually, when I was the Department of Justice, came to our gang summit. He knows more about what's going on in the street because he has saved more lives than anybody in this room. He's part of our group. We have a member from the Public Defender's Office. We have an incredible, we have uh, Professor James Taylor from USF, mm -hmm. who I learned something just Wednesday when he talked about the history and culture of policing, especially involving the African American community. He talked about how the police departments have been the tools of politicians. There's a war on drugs, go out there and arrest everybody. Now there's, we're pulling back, we don't want a war on drugs. Well, now that's going back the other way. You know, stop doing that. He talks about how the officers are manipulated by political bodies. He's part of our group. We have so many, we have people from the DPA, we have our interim director, Manuel Fortz, who's here tonight. We have people from the DPA in this group, and we're having that thing called the dialogue, where we're talking. And we're talking about, my group is community policing, which is a very wide open definition. What is community policing? Is it giving out stickers? Is it just walking a beat? Is it, you know, involved in the community? And I can tell you, I've been involved in this since I was a community DA. I've been involved in this as a law enforcement coordinator in the U.S. Attorney's Office, where I dealt with every police agency in the Northern District, including all the federal agencies. You know, community policing starts with a cop who treats everybody with respect. That's just a starting point. Okay. That's just the very beginning. So we are involved. We have meetings. We're going through this. And what happens at the end of the day is we'll be working on our community policing department general order, which has several subsets of the many recommendations by the DOJ. That will come to the chief for his review. Then after that, it comes to the police commission for more review from other members of the public. And we will put together, I think, will be the best community policing department general order and other DGOs in the country. Again, one that involves the community. There, there is one element I think that's missing in the conversation, really, and it's, 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 and to some degree, it's the POA, and the POA um, has the, been the one entity that's expressed the most resistance to changing the culture, and, and, and from my perspective, I think it has a lot to do with just a power struggle, right? In San Francisco, the San Francisco POA has been largely incredibly a powerful entity, and over the last several years, we have. Um, taken back some of that power from the POA, but they're, they, they're not attending with any regularity the police commission meetings. And the police commission, remember, is a civilian oversight body that is charged with um, um, developing the police department's policy. So in my opinion, they should be, they should, they, 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 a part, a participant, they should be t discussing, not influencing, not, not intimidating, not um, 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 scaring people, but instead of just always resisting, saying, no, we don't want this to change, challenging it, it's the POA that's bringing these items and suing us and bringing it to court. You know, there is, there is room for them at the table. Constantly, I think we definitely have an open uh, dialogue, but um, it's the POA that, file, that, um, that takes out these ads to attack Susie Loftus to politicize um, policy measures that are dealing with within the police commission. So it's it's that adversarial uh, um, adversarial element that still resists and coming to the table and being a part of the conversation. And when you talk to POA members one on one, it's like a um, they understand the the. the um, the changes and the directions, and one on one, they're 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 open to the change. But it's like group mentality that prevents uh, real change uh, from happening from the POA perspective. But the reality is, is that everybody else is on <laughs> with the program, yeah. but the POA, and so you know that largely has created um, that that has marginalized the POA to being so out of touch with reality. So out of far out of touch with reality that some of the things that they advocate for absurd, are absurd. For example, they uh, they advocated the the ability for SFPD to continue to shoot in, into moving cars when there are national policing organizations that have made uh, recommendations 
preventing that from happening, and that it's actually not in the officer's best interest to to um, to shoot into uh, to to moving vehicles. So sometimes they get in the POA gets in their own way, uh, in in just in their tirade of no 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 change. Yeah. So you, it sounds like, though, you're starting to see a shift. And again, Tippy, I'd like to hear your opinion on this, because I know you guys deal with them a lot at the police commission meetings. But is that shift really happening? We had the recent incident where a lot of officers chose to leave their membership in the Police Officers Association. Um, and what's the disconnect? What's the disconnect to the, the, the individuals you talk to who say, yes, we believe in reform, but the body is still very public about, you know, it's us against them and it's all about our safety? Well, you know, to remedy this, if you look at our working group, we have, there's other police officers groups, there's yep. PEG groups. Mm -hmm. And we have, I mean, say what you want about our police department, we're probably one of the most diverse police departments in the country. So we have members from the Officers for Justice, we have members from the Pride Alliance, the Asian Police Officers Association, the LPOA, the Latin Police Officers Association. Keep in mind, they're, almost all of them are also POA members, but they're on our working group because they bring incredible perspectives to the table. So I don't look at a group of people whether or not they're a member of the POA because I think the overwhelm, overwhelming majority of the police officers are members of the POA. You know, the POA, I would say, they're, they're a union organization. We're a union town. Their job is to represent the interest of their union members for job security and protection and safety. That's what they do. Now, how they go about doing it, it's up to the members to decide whether or not they're comfortable with the way it's taking place. And I really do wish that somebody from the POA was here this evening. Uh, but I will tell you, you know, they, like had, they had an opportunity to come. Oh, they did? I didn't know. So, <laughs> yeah. Public meeting, well yeah. publicized. So, you know, but at the end of the day, they represent their members, and it's up to the members to decide whether or not they're representing them. So, so. tip um, for both of you, what's the strategy to get buy-in from them going forward? Or do you think we need it? Well, we have to have buy-in. It's collective bargaining, as, you know, as Commissioner Loft or Susie Loftus and I have seen. You, you know, they come to the table eventually. And, but they have to buy in, but at the end of the day, it's the commissions can make a decision based upon what we hear from the officers and the public. But is there a strategy in place? Susie? Oh, no, I wasn't going to answer the strategy part. That's <laughs> you. <laughs> well, look, I think it's like everything I else. something else to offer. You know, you brought up I'll a good wait. point. It's, you know, okay. I don't like when it's us versus them, and that's the thing that we're all trying to work against, you know, in this room. Everybody here feels that that's not going to get anybody where we need to go. And I think at some point... You know, there's some very young members of the San Francisco Police Department, very, very young, idealistic members that probably don't think similar to what's being thought by some of the members of the POA. But having said that, you know, the POA has done a lot good for their membership. So there's a balancing they need to do. Okay, so the chief has a few comments yes, on this, it sounds he has like. To deal with them, not and us. then Malia. <laughs> yeah, so, so in terms of, and I, from what Commissioner Mazuko said, there, there's, many issues to, I think, working with the uh, union in terms of man management and, and, and labor. Uh, but when we are instituting reforms or any changes, number one, the process has to be uh, fair. It has to be fair. And there are situations where we must sit down with members of the POA and meet and confer on some issues and, and, and have uh, input from the POA. Now, once that's done, and all those conditions are met, we, we move forward. However, I think part of the recommendations that the DOJ uh, came back with is there should be procedural justice internally mm -hmm. in terms of our, 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 the members of our department having, number one, a voice and a say, not that they get to determine uh, you know, their own discipline or, or whatnot, but when there are those processes that are and changes that are put in place, part of the strategy, and I think it's good advice, is to have a procedurally just department. Now, in other words, we have to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't get to just make changes arbitrarily. There's a process for that. We respect that, just like with the use of force process. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we have a policy. Mm -hmm. Despite the, the arguments back and forth, we have a policy. It's in place. It's a solid policy, and everybody was heard. And I think with that, I'm very comfortable sitting here, you know, as the chief of this organization. If we've done everything that we're supposed to do in terms of respecting that process, 
letting everybody have the voice that the process says they should. Once that's done, we move forward. And I think at, at, with that, we have to be willing to listen, to honestly sit down and listen, and those issues that are, are, are real issues, be able to discuss them. Um, as Commissioner Mazuko said, I mean, the, the unions are there for a reason. There needs to be a balance with labor and management. That balance has to be fair, and there needs to be a process. Now, when it goes beyond that, I mean, when there's, you know, political maneuvering and whatnot, uh, some of that, as an organization, we just, I refuse to buy into. I'm not going to be a part of it. Uh, we move forward, we stay focused on the issues, we don't get caught up in the back and forth and public banter because we have too much work to do. And I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in that and really uh, be a part of the process that distracts from what we're trying to do. And I think part of the strategy is to really vet through that and let's discuss the real issues, let's make sure that the process is what it's supposed to be, and once that's done, we move forward and we progress. And if we do that, we'll be just fine. Okay. Malia? Thank you. Um, I have two things. I just wanted to make, there's a distinction between a, a PEG, a, was it a, a public employee group, yes. versus the POA, the Police Officers Association and the union structurally. PEGs, they're not collecting, they're not collecting money, they're not collecting resources, they're not able to advocate on behalf of um, legally um, on, in meet and confers. So the POA, is, it's you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a political being. I certainly see things through a political lens and when it has to do with power structure uh, and money and um, the POA exercises um, their own agenda. And I believe sometimes it's a counter to the, uh, to the beliefs and the desires of their own members. Um, and with the hope to maintain a, a, a power um, and influence for a certain small select group of few. Um, I also want to say that one of the things I believe that we can begin to do is to bring more women involved, women um, to to into law enforcement, and also uh, we a lot of the conversation has been around eth ethnic diversity, but I think that there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done around gender parity uh, in positions of power uh, within the law enforcement agency. So, uh, you know, what we're seeing is is that 11% of the female officers report to, to having firing their weapons on duty um, compared to 30% of male officers. I mean, that's a pretty significant um, statistic, and you can interpret it. We can say, well, there's more officers, maybe they're more on duty, and maybe they have more opportunities. We can certainly slice it both ways, but one thing that we know from studying about when women are at the table, at the decision-making tables, that decisions, frankly, better decisions, are made. Um, oh, I, I see there's some people that think like I do. <laughs> I'm in good company, um, but that there is some very serious um, added benefit to having more women um, on the command staff um, that are processing information and making decisions. Uh, so that is also something that I'd like to put out there. I think that's a structural change that we also need to see. Okay. I just, yes. I just, just one thing I want to add to, if you're, many people are probably calling you and saying like, what's going on in San Francisco? What worked? Just one thing to pull out that we did differently here, uh, uh, Commissioner Mazuko and this latest commission, which is now a new normal, is policy is made with, with stakeholders at the table. And yeah. I see Chief Chaplin, you know, like, yeah. Um, it was a big, what are you all going to do? What do you mean you're inviting the public defender? And the ACLU, yeah. Alan Schlosser there is our friend. And, you know, they're the ones who tell us everything's wrong and this is going to be a big fight. The thing that was amazing, we first did this with body cameras. We created an advisory group, the Bar Association. So many of you sat on it. And there was this idea we should be afraid, be afraid of more voices, be afraid of what they might say. And I was like, well, they're going to say it anyway. <laughs> it's just a matter of when and whether they're screaming at me at the end when I have the piece of paper and it's all ink, ink is dry. So why don't we just ask them on the front end? And that was this crazy revelation that's now the new normal. But what was lost in that? were these incredible meetings where the POA lawyer who, you know, was agreeing with the public defender and then the policy was getting changed. And Julie, you were there. I mean, it was, there were moments that were frustrating, but there are also moments where you have this experience that we too rarely have where we sit in a conversation with people who don't agree with us. And we find that while we don't agree on everything, maybe we have some common ground. And so I think while we got to a good outcome and Sam Ramarian and Julie and 
Mike Nevin from the POA. There were people that were trying to get to a better place, but in terms of exporting things that we did here that might work elsewhere, I think we demonstrated that bringing in diverse viewpoints on the front end just resulted in a better, stronger policy, if not a challenging, series of challenging conversations that ultimately got us to a better place. Also adding to diverse voices, I think academics, bringing academics in who study, um, um, uh, study many aspects of policing, police reform, uh, group think, um, society changes, and all these different norms um, that are changing, having their perspective also has added a significant, um, of a significant voice and perspective in, into the discussion. And so organizations like um, the Bar Association have been absolutely critical because they present to be um, um, nonpartisan. No, in the end, they, they're just looking for justice. And so they're able to come in and bridge the gap when there is a gulf between um, the, uh, the, the department and the commission or the POA and the city. Um, so, Malia, um, I'll go to you second on this. I'm going to go to the chief first about the new changes with the Department of Public Accountability, again, from the Board of Supervisors' perspective. You were very, very active in getting that reformed from the OCC. So Chief, as the leader of a department, what are you expecting the DPA to help you do to run your department and hold your department accountable to the public? Well, they have very defined and specific roles in that, but mainly um, with our formulation, first of all, discipline. I mean, all complaints from the public are investigated by, by the OCC, and it's what the voters have long ago asked for, and, and now that's been expanded to include the ability to audit the department, which is very important. Um, it also is, gives them the ability to weigh in in a, in a very meaningful way on needed policy changes and reform, which is very important because policies <laughs> have to evolve, and I know uh, through the leadership of, of uh, Ms. Loftus, former president of the police commission and you know, Commissioner Mazuko and others, um, a lot of effort has gone into policy evolution. And you know, even before I got here, my understanding that OCC, now DPA, was very involved in that process, which is very important. Because they get to see things from a perspective, just based on what they do, that gives them some insight on where we need to change. And, and they're able to, to weigh in on that discussion. Um, I want to echo something that Ms. Lofts has just said about the body cameras and the body-worn cameras that we have in place. The fact that this department, you know, t almost 23, 2,400 uh, employees, that that policy was done in the, in the, in the, as quick as it was, and that those cameras are fully deployed in the city is phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal work, and I think to do it with public input, to do it with all the, the pieces that, that go into making policy here in San Francisco. I mean, I, for those of you that aren't aware of kind of what goes into that, it, it is phenomenal work. And I, I, you know, I was not here when it happened, uh, but it's phenomenal work and I think it, it, it deserves applause. And I know the Bar Association was a part of that. But <laughs> That, that's a huge transformation in and of itself that's going to, in my opinion, pay many dividends. And there are a lot of people that you know, were involved in that work, including DPA. But it just shows what can be accomplished. Well, and other than the evidentiary um, value of, of camera footage, um, there's a lot of data that can come from the collection of that. And I know we touched upon that a little bit earlier. What, and this is one of the questions from the audience, why is data collection important? We already know that San Francisco doesn't collect data very well, uh, right? We looked at that with um, the task force. There are certain things that are still captured on index cards and in a police car after a stop. Um, and I know we're trying to move to an, an electronic uh, system that can, again, pick up trends and behaviors that will then lead to better training of officers. So can you just speak to that a little bit, like how the cameras will feed into that and then what you're doing around data? Um, in your department? Well, there's a lot, there's a lot that can be done with, with data. And I know uh, to, to go to what's happening across the Bay in Oakland with the camera footage and some of the work that they've done with uh, Dr. Dr. Jennifer Everhart around looking at the data or the footage in those cameras to really uh, 
have a discussion and, and set some, I say, policies around the work of implicit bias. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's a huge step in the right direction in terms of what we were talking about earlier and what does the data really tell us? What does that footage really tell us? Now we can take a look back um, and really, in a meaningful way, get experts to look at this, this data and this information to help guide us moving forward. Now, as important as policing is in this country, I'll give you an analogy. Those of you that like sports and football and basketball and baseball, you name your sports, hockey. Uh, soccer. Soccer. <laughs> in, any sport. Said name sport. Millions of dollars are spent on this very thing. Professional athletes go back and they study video. They study mm -hmm. video. They study video to get better. How important is policing to this country? It really determines... <laughs> So many things that are important to this nation in terms of safety, in terms of how people feel about uh, their civil rights, and just, just so many things are determined by policing. If we can do it in professional sports, how can we can't do it in something as important as police work? And that ability to study the data, to really understand what it means, and put academic minds into the conversation, because we can't do it alone, um, is really, in my opinion, the way that we're really gonna make a difference in terms of getting better in terms of policing our, our, our city and our country. And you have to have the infrastructure to extrapolate the data, to pull the data. We're doing a lot of good things. You know, some people at this table, Supervisor Cohen has introduced local legislations. It really puts us ahead of the game mm -hmm. in terms of collecting data. And I think we're ahead of the curve, but then what do we do from here? Yeah. Who do we get into the conversation? Who do we get to study what we're doing? Who do we get to partner with us and do the research? Because that's the next phase of this evolution is we really have to get the right people in the room to push us forward and really understand what this data means. Okay, so the last two questions. First, um, Malia, following up on the DPA question, as a, from a border supervisor's perspective, what do you want this new sure. department so, to be and do? Let's step back. Office of Citizens Complaint, OCC, was already in existence for many years. It was a department that was charged with the duty of tracking officer complaints civilians had against officers. Um, I introduced legislation and carried it last year, um, and it passed overwhelmingly. And it provided two functions. First, it changed the name of the department to the Department of Police Accountability to better describe the functions of the department. Second, it gave auditing authority to this department to audit the police department, um, that which never existed. And second, which I think was just as critical as, as the auditing function, is whenever there is an officer involved shooting, it is this department that would conduct the independent investigation. And that really came, was born out of being sick and tired of watching SFPD and the DA um, investigate themselves whenever there was an officer involved shooting. We needed swift, fair, and transparent investigations to happen. So this has been a progression over the last three years now of how do we begin to transform and better police ourselves and ensure that we have the best tools that are available. The other piece of legislation that you were just talking about, data collection, I also authored that legislation. Incredibly important because if we're not collecting the data and we're not counting, we're not paying attention. We're not paying attention and we're relying on anecdotal stories to tell the story. Now that we have the ability to begin to capture the data, we need to now develop relationships, deep partnerships with, with universities, with statisticians, to help us begin to analyze the data. We talk about predictive policing, but what exactly is predictive pr policing? I don't know. But we have some data sets now that we are developing and we're culling through to begin to help us paint a picture of what the data says. Um, and it's really talking about getting smart on crime. I mean, we're talking about data-driven policy now, one that will hopefully be void of bias, both conscious and unconsciousness, so that we have fair and just justice for everyone, fairness and justice for everyone. Okay, thank you. So, Norm, if you had to rewrite one of your books that you wrote right after 
you retired right after you went through the experience of the tear gas with the Occupy protests in Washington. How would your book be different now in 2017? The, the first book describes uh, what happened uh, under my leadership during the WTO. Uh, as I've confessed uh, more recently, I was five years into retirement and on book tour when um, I came to the realization that I had made the worst decision of my 34-year police career on the streets of Seattle, where we use chemical agents, a euphemism for tear gas, against nonviolent and non-threatening protesters. Our fellow Americans assembled and expressing a view about globalization in, in, this, in this world. The company supported the decision, my field commander, my operations commander, and did so well into retirement when I got no dog in the game. <laughs> you know, I came to the conclusion that, that I had made a terrible, terrible decision, which I think turned things um, for the worse on just day two of that conference. Day one, I'm, I'm basking in the reflected glow of praise for my officers and how disciplined and restrained and professional and friendly they all were. That's on a Monday. On Tuesday morning, that all went south. It, and it was, it was really quite awful. The company is saying we have to clear this intersection. We can't get a, an aid car, or an ambulance. We can't get a police car or a fire truck or any other emergency vehicle through here if we needed to. So it's the operations side, the cop side in me that's saying that. The chief in me, the leader in me, should have been saying, what are the odds that somebody's going to be bleeding out two blocks on the other side of that congested intersection? Or giving birth to a baby or in the throes of cardiac arrest or what have you. What really were the odds? Did we really have to clear that intersection? I was uh, signing books at Elliott Bay Book Company, actually at Town Hall in, in Seattle, and a man came up, a nice crowd of people who had bought the book and wanted it signed, and I noticed he had no book in his hand, and I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting. What's, he, he wants to say something to me, and indeed he did. His statement was, I used to respect you. And I thought, well, oh, I, nobody really wants to hear that, but why? Uh, why are you saying this? And he said, because of what you just described. You tear gassed innocent people of whom I was one. You tear gassed us. We were exercising our First Amendment rights. What you did was terrible. And I remember telling him, well, I'm afraid we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. For those police tactical reasons, we needed to do what we did. We didn't have nearly enough police officers for that, uh, you know, you know, 50, 60,000 demonstrators on the streets of a city of 530,000 at the time. So uh, I just basically kissed him off. I, I was, you know, I, I took seriously his concern, but what could I do about it? We just have to agree to disagree. And then I listened to a whole lot of other people talk about what we did to them uh, during that week. And as I said, five years into retirement, uh, I'm now giving another talk and making a public apology at Kane Hall at the University of Washington. Unbeknownst to me, that same man was in the audience. He came up afterwards, and I was signing books after that talk. Uh, and he had tears rolling down his cheeks. Uh, I characterize it a little bit differently. I said we both smiled and agreed to disagree. In fact, he was weeping. And it was a very emotional moment for him as well as for me that I had apologized. And that really reinforces for me the necessity for when we get it wrong to say we did mm -hmm. and to uh, go about the business of making sure that it doesn't turn out that way the next time. The one thing I did want to say uh, in appreciation of what you you said, Susie, that this this is National Police Appreciation Week. Uh, personally, I was not inspired by Donald Trump's talk today uh, on, on the steps of the Capitol. 
in appreciating police officers in which he said, in effect, they can do no wrong and we have an obligation to support them no matter what they do. That's me paraphrasing, but it's fairly close to what he said. And I would say to him and to others something I said earlier, and that is that if we really want uh, to develop more and more appreciation of our police officers, let's give them support, let's invite them into the process as the chief has talked about. There's no reason they should not be at the table, that their voices should not be heard and, 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 uh, and listened to respectfully. I, I've seen so many good police officers who are very effective crime fighters and for whom uh, their fellow American civil liberties mean something. Watching them in action, a thing of beauty. What a tough, tough job. It's sensitive, it's delicate, it's occasionally dangerous. It's a very demanding job for all the reasons that we've talked about. And I think we need to appreciate our officers and one of the best ways to express that is by working on policies and procedures that make their work safer and help to guarantee public safety and, and neighborhood health. So I, I guess what I would say is, not only did we get snookered in Seattle, which is the title of the chapter that I wrote in the first book, um, at least one of us uh, has been forced to cop out to making a horrible mistake. Okay. Yeah. So these last two questions are from the audience. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on the panel can answer this one, but if you can, please speak up. To the extent that the federal government cuts funding that affects the San Francisco city and county uh, budget for police reform, how will the commission and the task force proceed? Yeah. Well, from the commission perspective, oh, yeah. I'm sure we're gonna have the support of the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> And we already do. Uh, with what we're doing in my working group, there's a member from the budget office there. We're getting support. I, if COPS goes away, which I, hopefully it won't go away, we're still going to do what we're supposed to do. So, again, a lot of us are volunteers. Everybody in the committee is a volunteer. So the amount of money it takes is more for administrative, and I think that for the greater good of the city. And, and, and Supervisor Cohn's been at the forefront of all this. I feel pretty confident we're going to have the funding. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also the chair of the budget committee. I appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the reality is, is that we as a city are facing some serious federal cuts, most notably to our public health um, safety nets. We, uh, ha we are not anticipating major draconian cuts from the federal government. Um, there may be some homeland security dollars, I think, um, that, are, that, are po that possibly can be cut, but in terms of still being able to be on, on target with police academy classes, to still be on target to, to have uh, and cover the SFPD's budget, that we are definitely um, on target to do. The cuts that do come down from the federal government are, would be, fa we would feel in, uh, after fiscal year, I say uh, around fiscal year 19, after 18, 19. So we would have a little bit of a cushion to begin to develop a, a stronger, more long-term strategy if that were the case, if those cuts were actually to come. And I'd also say to everybody here, the, it's, the power's really up to you all because that's what the DOJ said. They said, look, we're not going consent decree. It's, this, is a, this is a jurisdiction where the people and the elected leaders care enough about this issue that they're the ones to hold the commission and the department to account for delivering. So um, there are certain departments where they felt like they needed the federal uh, oversight role and for various reasons. And here, when they came to San Francisco, they said this is a place where you all will hold your local elected officials and appointed officials accountable on these changes that have been committed to. So the power actually resides with us in here in San Francisco. It's not something that we need to rely on that support from Washington. Okay. So about 10 seconds for each of you. We're just going to do a quick round robin to close this out. A lot has been said around the country about community policing, but practically speaking, what does that look like in the ground on, in San Fran on the ground in San Francisco? Tippy. In 10 seconds, community policing in San Francisco is a dialogue between our police officers and the community. It's very simple. And it's having the community having trust that our police officers are being selected for this job appropriately selected for the job, they represent the diversity of the community, they represent the interests of the community, and that there's a backbone to support this, and that there's discipline. That if the officers do deviate, 
they will be disciplined. And more importantly, there's policies and procedures that will, we could train them to to make sure we have the best police department in the country. But more importantly, it's you know respect on both sides. There will be 2,000 calls for service today in San Francisco. And we won't hear about any ne negative interaction in those 2,000 calls. So an appreciation of what the officers do on the street, but more importantly, accountability. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think <laughs> accountability and transparency, I think they're buzzwords that get thrown on, around a lot, but it's incredibly important for us to continue to shine light uh, on on the process. And like the chief said earlier, we have a process. We need to stick to the process and remember that no one is above the process, no one is above the law, and each person should be dealt with accordingly. So if an officer breaks the law, um, then they should be punished accordingly. If a, law, if a citizen is not abiding by the law, then they should be punished accordingly. And I think that that will begin to uh, bring us back to community policing. This is, again, taking it a step further from officers being in the community, a step further than just walking on the street, walk, walking and playing basketball. I think traditional manifestations of, of po community policing, but community, true acu uh, community accountability. Thank you. Norm, what does community policing look like to you? Community policing for me is the community policing itself with a lot of help from a variety of partners, um, not the least of whom are those who wear uniforms uh, and police their streets. But the community policing itself in partnership, and partners don't make unilateral and arbitrary decisions. They, they make part uh, these decisions jointly. Uh, operationalizing that is the challenge, and I would just conclude with this, that if a police department decides, this is something would also go into that book, um, different from what I've got in there now, but and that is, um, we all talk about the sanctity of human life. How do we operationalize that? How do we get a police department, all of its members, to embrace the sanctity of human life? And I would argue, as I've been lately, that you do that by saying nobody dies tonight. Nobody dies on this call. I'm not gonna die as a police officer. I'm going home tonight to my family, my loved ones, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that nobody else dies tonight. It could be that 15 year old with a knife high on LSD, it could be, pick any case from the headlines, nobody, nobody dies tonight, okay, thank operationalized. You. Chief, what is community policing practically on the ground in San Francisco? 10 seconds. All, <laughs> <laughs> all encompassing, it is all encompassing. And that, what I mean by that is, it's not just the police department. Every entity in city government plays a role in community and public safety. And it has to be done in an inclusive manner with everybody involved in the process and giving everybody given a voice to, to weigh in on how our city is policed. And I think if we can do that, it it works. If we don't, if we operate in a silo, if we if we if we dictate what that means and not not get input from the community or actually the voice from the community to decide how we need to police our city, it doesn't work. So it has to be everybody. And it just in my, I'm exceeding my 10 seconds, but just one example <laughs> you of this. Have a gun, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but one example of this is how we will tackle the whole issue around homelessness. I mean, that's an issue that it takes every facet of, of city government and the community to really, to get to where we want to get to. And it can't just be done by the police department or mm -hmm. Department of Homeless Assistance, Port of Housing, or just the borders. Everybody has to be in, in this. And that's really what community policing is. You have to bring all the resources to the table in order to address the health and safety of a community. Okay. Mine's pretty practical. I see Captain John Sanford out there, captains of the police. Hello, how you doing? Park Station. San Francisco's 10 stations. Everybody here probably lives or works in San Francisco. You, this is a small enough city, uh, but the department is run that the captain is somebody, if you live in that neighborhood, you should know your police captain. You know, I come from, my mom was not born in this country, and I even have my own issues with authority. Like, am I supposed to, can I call the captain? Yes, you can call the captain. That is community policing. I don't know if Assistant Chief Chaplin was there. One time I tried to give out a captain's cell phone. That didn't go well. Call the station. <laughs> but the idea is it's your 
police department, communities, police and police or community, work with them, help them when they need help, when they're doing bicycle giveaways, mm -hmm. when they're trying to help kids in the neighborhood build community, go to the picnic, be a part of this. It, when it's other, we're not having community policing, we're all talking. So pick up the phone, get more involved, uh, whether you live or work in San Francisco with your police captain and the folks who work there. So everyone, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and please be reminded that this has been live cast and recorded by SF Gov TV, so it's accessible on the internet. And thank you all for staying with us until 5 after 8 tonight. <laughs>